Good afternoon. My name is Kent Orman, and I'm the chairman of the uh, Dr. Cog uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, known as Dr. Cog TAC. I call the June 28th meeting to order. Uh, we use it, Dr. Cog is using a digital platform and um, it's Zoom. Members and alternates, you have the uh, ability to mute and unmute yourselves and share your webcam. This is a new newer platform for Dr. Cog. And even though we're able to use cameras, we still ask that you use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or would like to speak to an agenda item or questions or comments. Please make sure that you've typed your name, uh, ref reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to the staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. At this time, Cam, will you list all, uh, will you do roll call of the attendee, uh, Dr. Uh, TAC committee? And uh, if for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam so he, your name can be added to the record. Cam? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance for members and alternates, I currently see Ron Papsdorf, Kent Mormon, Brooke Svoboda, uh, Frank Bruno, Aaron Busto, Art Griffith, Alex Hyde-Wright, Bill Soroy, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, Carson Priest, David Gaspers, Deborah Basket, George Hollenkoff, Jean Sanson, Jeff Denkenbring, uh, Jessica Furco, Kelly Heaton, Mac Calson, Megan Davis, uh, Rick Pilgrim, um, Sarah Grant, Steve Durian, and Tom uh, Schomer. Those are all the members I currently see right now, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Cam. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize Tom Schumer, who's um, going to be retiring from uh, Bro City and County of Broomfield here in the next couple of weeks. And Jacob, you had a couple of things for him. First of all, Tom, we wish you well in your retirement and uh, hope you have an enjoyable one. So Jacob, and then we'll let Tom have a few minutes to speak. Jacob? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to recognize uh, Tom's service to uh, Dr. Cog, to the TAC, and to the region at large. Um, Tom let me know that he spent 24 years at Broomfield, five years at Jeffco, and 10 years in the consulting world. Um, obviously, those numbers don't quite add up. He must have started his career in elementary school, but you know, just a legacy of service to this region, um, really, really unmatched um, in a lot of ways. And we really appreciate, um, you know, I've known Tom for years, and he's just been such a thoughtful um, person and just a, just a wonderful person to work with, and has done so much for this region. He also served as chair of the TAC back in the 2006 era. So, just wanted to take that moment to recognize Tom um, and his service um, to all of us in this region. Tom, did you want to say a couple words to put you on the spot? Oh, I appreciate you uh, recognizing me today, and I appreciate the the Dr. Cog uh, system, and it's worked well over the years, and uh, it's definitely been a, a growing experience, I think, for for all the cities and counties out there. And I uh, just wish you all well in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. At this time, we'll uh, open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which time uh, we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussions uh, regarding each item. Uh, do we have any, uh, if you have a public comment, please raise your hand. I am not seeing any, Cam, are you? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I am not. All right. Well, with that, then uh, we'll close public comment. 
um, and move on to the um, uh, May 24th, 2021 TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the May 24th, uh, 2021 TAC meeting summary? Please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question, correction, or would like to speak. I see no uh, hands raised, uh, therefore um, the minute stand uh, approved as written. We'll now move on to the action items. Um, the first uh, item today is um, the fiscal year 2022-23 transportation demand management services set aside eligibility. It's attachment B in your packet. And Steve Erickson will be making a presentation on that. Steve, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me add my congratulations to Tom. And let me uh, see if I can pull this up and share this deck. Can you see that now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you, Ron. So uh, the information in the deck and, and actually in the packet is um, probably going to seem pretty familiar to most of you. This is in large part the same information that was present, presented last month as an informational item and uh, here today to hopefully take action on it. So I'll, I'll go through it pretty quickly. We definitely had some, some great questions last month and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions uh, today as, as well. So again, just to sort of frame this, um, we're really talking about um, you know in the 2020 to 2023 tip, uh, there is a set aside sort of look at that, that first um, uh, blue highlighted box, the TDM services set aside for four years includes uh, roughly $13.4 million for uh, TDM services, which uh, is made up of $8.8 .8 million for Dr. Cog's Way to Go program, uh, $2.8 million for the seven regional TMAs, uh, that partnership. And what we're talking about today is that $1.8 million over four years for TDM non-infrastructure projects. Uh, so the purpose of these projects is really to support marketing, outreach, and, and research uh, uh, projects that will reduce single occupant vehicle travel. So really all of it is very complementary to uh, what we do in the Way to Go program and as a partnership. So we're wanting to reduce traffic congestion in order to improve our air quality. We look to pilot new approaches uh, to TDM. Uh, we are very interested in supporting healthy and active choices, uh, so biking and walking are good examples of that. And um, as part of what we focus on, we re really want to improve awareness and access, of course, to mobility options for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. So for this two-year cycle, again, we have $900,000 available for these projects. And I think most of you are familiar with uh, most of the uh, eligibility stuff, so uh, won't spend much time on that. Uh, we are going to uh, propose a, a two-step process again, initially a letter of intent to sort of review broad concepts related to some of these TDM projects and then a more formal application process. So kind of winding your way uh, through this snake of a graphic, um, we'll first start with a mandatory TDM uh, service application workshop to, to kick things off. At that point, we'll be asking potential project sponsors to uh, identify projects that they think might be a good fit, and then that's where we'll ask them to submit that, that letter of intent. Uh, Dr. Cog staff uh, in my division primarily will review those letters of intent and have an opportunity to have discussions with potential project sp sponsors. Uh, and then if we've determined a particular project is a good fit, we'll be inviting uh, those sponsors to actually submit a formal application. I'll talk in a, a minute about sort of the project review and scoring process. Uh, once we've selected projects, we'll then bring those uh, back as a proposal to um, offer recommendation to this committee 
uh, RTC and ultimately the Dr. Cobb board as well. And then we begin that uh, uh, process of, of notifying um, uh, the applicants and, and that formal contracting process with CDOT. So we'll uh, be establishing a review panel and the re review panel will have both internal and external stakeholders. We typically have uh, folks from my division where we oversee the Way to Go program, as well as uh, our area agency on aging, transportation planning and operations and regional planning and development. And then we will invite external stakeholders as well. I think for every one of these calls, we've had somebody from uh, Federal Highways participate, uh, CDOT, uh, CDPAG, and a variety then of, of other sort of TDM uh, affiliated stakeholders in the region. So Regional Air Quality Council, RTD, um, will occasionally, if, if um, uh, they're not a project sponsor, even invite um, uh, one of the TMAs uh, to participate. So each member of the panel will review uh, the applications on a, uh, a variety of criteria, and those were included in the first section in your packet. And then we also have sort of a data-driven uh, series of criteria that where Dr. Cog actually does that, that scoring. And I'll get to the specifics on that, I think, on the next slide. A review panel comes together, uh, has a discussion, kind of looking at the initial scoring uh, conversation. Sometimes in those conversations, um, you know, people will... Uh, panelists will will choose to adjust their scores if there's something that's you know highlighted that they maybe hadn't considered with respect to a particular project. But ultimately, and it's typically been over the course of two or three of those review panel meetings, we come up with that list of uh, projects, which we'll then uh, bring before you all for a recommendation. In terms of the specifics on that review panel scoring, uh, VMT reduction is, of course, king, um, and uh, you know we're also looking, as I said, for those projects that have uh, perhaps some level of innovation or uniqueness. Um, you know, wanting to learn if there might be a particular approach uh, that we've 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 not taken advantage of in, in the region. Replicability really speaks to if this is successful. Um, in a particular geographic area, you know, can we can we uh, look to kind of uh, do that across the region or in other uh, similar geographic areas? Uh, and then you can see access, funding effectiveness. These are all things that the review panel scores. On the data-driven scoring that is done by Dr. Cog staff, um, we will overlay uh, a project area and look to see if it aligns with some of the short trip opportunity um, zones. So that would kind of give an idea if there's um, a good opportunity, particularly for some of the uh, the active transportation. Um, you know, we know if this is something where, um, you know, biking and, and walking um, might be proposed in, in this uh, marketing proposal or this outreach propo proposal, that that might be a good fit. We do look at environmental justice areas, um, look at uh, urban centers, and then lastly, sort of look at, uh, this is just sort of to the strength of the application, if they have good financial partners and, and a local match. So I'm happy uh, with that to answer any questions and, and you'll see before you a proposed motion. If you have uh, questions for Steve, please raise your hand. I do not see any hands raised. Uh, if someone would like to make a motion, if you'd please raise your hand. Got a shy group today, I guess. <laughs> Brian, please go ahead. Well, I'll break the silence. I'll break the silence. So uh, here we go. Uh, move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the eligibility rules and evaluation process for selecting non infrastructure, i.e., marketing, outreach, and research projects to be funded through the TDM services set aside of the FY 2020 through 2023 transportation improvement program. Thank you, Brian. And uh, I think we have a second. If you go ahead, is it Frank, I believe? Yep, uh, Frank Bruno here. I'll second that motion. 
Okay, thank you. We it's been moved and seconded. Um, um, and uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed uh, say no. And any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Got your marching directions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Bye. Uh, next uh, action item is the Unified uh, Planning uh, Work Program called UPWIP and uh, from the Denver re for the Denver region. And Josh, I understand you're gonna present this. Yes, one second. And I believe you should be seeing my screen now. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so hello to uh, everyone, good afternoon. Um, as you may recall at your meeting in early April, I believe, uh, presented on the development of the Unified Planning Work Program. So excited to be back today with a draft document uh, for your consideration. So just as a quick recap, the UPWP uh, is a document which describes all of the transportation planning activities to be conducted in our region over a two year period. The draft document is for federal fiscal years 2022 and 2023. This is a federally required uh, product that we produce in our role as the MPO for the Denver region. Uh, and it documents how federal transportation planning funds are spent in our region. We also use it internally as a tool for scheduling, uh, budgeting, uh, staff and uh, resource management within our agency. So as we develop the UPWP, we have to keep several things in mind. Uh, there are several federally required uh, tasks that we complete. Some of those are shown on your screen, our uh, long range regional transportation plan, short range transportation improvement program, our congestion management process, as well as the modeling and development of our air quality conformity determinations. Um, there are also 10 federal transportation planning factors that must be taken into account. Um, and one section of the UPWP details those 10 and what activities in the document address each of the 10. We also locally have our Metro Vision Plan and Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, which really set the vision for what we want the transportation system and uh, our larger vision for the region. Um, so those, of course, shape the activities that we conduct to move us in that direction. So in this specific document, um, if you view it, you will see an accomplishment section as we've had in the past. Um, just want to point out on this one, I won't go through uh, all of these, but these are just a few highlights of some of the accomplishments that have taken place during the course of the, the previous current 2020 to 2021 UPWP. Um, obviously, uh, a, a difficult, a non-traditional time um, to be working, but definitely still produced some, some major planning uh, documents during this time. I think uh, staff, both at Dr. Cog and our partner agencies, as well as uh, our committee and board members can kind of give themselves a pat on the back for continuing to produce some great work uh, during a challenging time. So the kind of meat of the document is the actual list of activities and tasks. Um, those have the same structure that you might have seen in the past if you viewed this document before. Uh, it's broken down into seven objectives. Within each objective are several activities, which are sort of issue specific areas. And then within each activity is a bullet point list of tasks to be completed, as well as any deliverables or work products that will be produced. Uh, these are the seven objectives. I won't go through each one, but um, they're, they're fairly similar to what was in the previous UPWP. There has been some wordsmithing as well as some minor moving of activities between objectives, but overall the structure remains pretty similar to what we've had in the past. Just a few highlights of what some of the activities in the document are. Um, and again, this is nowhere near the uh, the total list of tasks to be completed, just wanted to pull out a few to highlight. 
Um, so including, included in that is the development of our new uh, 2024 to 27 transportation improvement program, including uh, the regional and sub-regional calls for projects that will occur um, additional activities to implement the 2050 MVRTP that was recently adopted, as well as some implementation and possible updates around several of our uh, area specific planning documents that Dr. Cog has produced. Some new activities include uh, piloting a new Dr. Cog led corridor planning, as well as a community based planning initiative, and more information on that will come as those are developed further as well as the production of uh, some, some data products that many of you are familiar with through our planimetric project, land cover project, and aerial photography project. So I just wanted to quickly note, um, some of you may have uh, noticed a, a second email after the initial uh, TAC packet was sent out with some new funding tables. We had gotten some uh, updated numbers from CDOT and wanted to ensure that the tables were accurate. So what you see in front of you is, should be the accurate table um, for our revenues. The, the change was just a small increase in the revenues available. Um, table two, which is the expenditures table was also updated. I believe that uh, increased amount was rolled into the anticipated carryover funds on that table. Uh, these have been updated in the document that is posted on the event page on the Dr. Cog calendar for this meeting and will be in the versions moving forward to the RTC and board. So there's a proposed motion in front of you. Um, next steps, we intend to take this uh, document to the RTC and board at their July meetings. Um, we also have an e-blast out to collect public comment on the document. Um, tech members are more than welcome to provide comments or questions here today, or if you have, if you think of those uh, further in the future, you can reply to that e-blast with those comments. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Otherwise, the uh, proposed motion is before you. Uh, are there any questions or comments um, or concerns? Um, please raise your hand and we will call on you. Deborah Basket, go ahead. Hi, um, I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft FY 2022, FY 2023, UPWP. Thank you for all your work, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Is there a second? Uh, Brooke Savada? Boda? I second. Thank you, Brooke. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any additional discussion? I see two hands up. I assume those are just up yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so we moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move into our informational items. And our first one will be on shared micromobility in the Denver region. And Emily Lindsay will be making that presentation, I believe. So Emily, go ahead. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emily Lindsay. I'm a transportation technology strategist at Dr. Cog, um, and I'll be chatting a little bit about shared micromobility in the Denver region. And I know there's a lot of new mobility terms out there, so I just wanted to kind of set the playing field here. When I say shared micromobility, I'm talking about these small human and electric powered transportation solutions like bikes and scooters that are part of a shared fleet. So this might be traditional bike share in a dock, it might be e-scooters. Um, so there's a bunch of different kinds of devices that kind of fit under this shared micromobility umbrella. We know they are deployed and kind of growing throughout the United States. This is even just looking at this, which is the end of 2019, we've seen a lot of growth even throughout the pandemic, um, especially in Colorado. We know that the trip growth of these shared micromobility trips is kind of just exponential. As you can see here, this is again national data that looks at ridership 
Uh, and it really just dwarfs kind of that traditional station baked, based bike share that we've had for the last decade or so. Um, and you can kind of see that that growth in the 2020 chart would be a, another bar up there. Um, and to give you an idea about what 2020 looked like here in the Denver region. So this is uh, local regional data, data that uh, looks at the number of trips that we had in 2020. So we had uh, around 2 million trips in shared micro mobility um, fleets. Again, this really shows kind of the big picture, right? 2 million trips, a lot of them happening kind of in that afternoon window. Um, and a lot of those trips really serving that short trip purpose. So many, many trips uh, are kind of less than a mile, a lot of them less than half a mile. The median trip distance for shared micromobility trips in 2020 in our region uh, was just under a mile. So just to give you all some context, again, of all of our trips in the region, 43% are less than three miles, 19% are less than one mile. So it's really serving those purposes trip purposes that uh, are short in nature. So we definitely see that link between shared micromobility and kind of meeting the needs of those short trips. And of course, there is that connection to Metro Vision outcomes and civic goals. I think we see a lot of potential um, to improve access to jobs and services, potentially air quality improvements, congestion reduction, mode shift, um, VMTR. I think we also note that even since we beginning, began talking about shared micromobility, there's been a lot of changes in the field. So with that rapid change of innovation, we really know that we have to be flexible. We have to take a coordinated approach to kind of work together. I think that even just calling it shared micromobility is something um, that, that demonstrates that flexibility, right? Because that umbrella of, of vehicle types just kind of keeps growing. And so, a couple of you on this call have been with us on this micromobility journey since the beginning. In March 2019, Dr. Cogstaff convened a regional micromobility work group, um, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's made up of a lot of local agency staff, CDOT, RTD, and even some federal partners. Um, and during that first year, we met monthly to talk through different policy um, considerations. And now we meet quarterly, really just to keep updated and make sure that we're addressing topics of, of importance to our local agencies and partners. And so as part of our work in the micromobility space, we really also rely on what's happening in the country. Um, so we have coordinated with a bunch of different MPOs or regional bodies, just like Dr. Cog, to see how they're kind of taking on shared micromobility and micromobility into their transportation planning more generally and how they kind of plan to move forward with addressing things like new mobility and emerging mobility. And so um, with the Dr. Cog Micromobility Workgroup, we really wanted to outline our conversations around really specific policy areas. So we wanted to discuss things like national practices, um, kind of the state of the practice. <laughs> Again, it was so new at the time, there weren't necessarily best practices. Um, and I think a lot of things have changed, right, since we've had started those conversations. But we really did want to address a bunch of different components of how shared micromobility kind of fits into the transportation ecosystem, whether that is the kind of general operating structure, like how does that, how do we regulate shared micromobility to things like operations, uh, where do scooters go? Uh, but also covering important things like equipment, safety, um, equity, communications, community engagement, and then data, which I'll get into here in a little bit. But we wanted to have these conversations um, really and kind of do a deep dive into each one of these. And so we uh, recently released um, at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, a shared micromobility in the Denver region document, which documented all of our conversations with this work group in some of those uh, focus areas. We outlined different local agency implementation considerations, um, along with some goals that we wanted to have around region, regional consistency. So. We certainly recognize that shared micromobility might look different in each um, local area throughout our region, but there are some things that we do uh, want to keep consistent, whether that is the kind of data that we collect or the operational domain. Um, and so that's really detailed in that document under the areas for collaboration. And since everybody's gotten really good at using QR codes <laughs> these days with the pandemic, um, I figured I would throw one on this slide if you want to pull up your camera on your phone, uh, this will take you to the document itself. It's also on Dr. Cog's website um, for you to check out. But it's a really great resource 
that will kind of continue to update as new programs come online. Um, but it outlines what's happening in the region. Where did we have pilots? What happened to those pilots? Um, and then if you're a new community uh, that's kind of considering shared micromobility and bringing that in onto your um, streets, it's a great resource for you to kind of see what other folks in the region have done. And so one of those areas for collaboration that was really important to stakeholders was micromobility data. No one had kind of a ready to go uh, platform or thing set up to ingest and um, kind of put out meaningful metrics around micromobility. So we thought it would be a great thing to approach consistently across the region. So we've been working um, alongside some local and regional partners uh, to kind of test out what a shared platform might look like. Um, so we have been using Ride Report uh, since 20, early 2020, the month before the pandemic. We, this was like our last in-person kickoff project. Um, but this has really evolved as communities like Aurora have come online as well with programs. Um, and this provides local agencies a tool to kind of manage the data, manage programs in real time. You can log on, there are maps that identify popular routes. There are charts that lo look at different trip type, uh, trip distance, and you can actually look real time what's happening in your community. Are there uh, vehicles with low batteries? Um, are there vehicles that have been sitting in the same place for you know more than 24 hours? So it kind of gives that planning approach because it has a lot of dashboards and maps and tools like that, but also the operator perspective uh, for how you operate on a day to day um, scale. And so the city and county of Denver has been doing this since February 2020. They use it every day to manage their shared micromobility program. The city of Aurora recently launched a shared micromobility program and they've been using Ride Report as well. So just to give a little bit more background um, on this, there are pretty specific use cases, kind of like I mentioned on the day-to-day -day program management side, um, but we're also seeing new uses like identifying parking or corral locations. So we can see where trips end, uh, which is a pretty good indication of where we might need some extra parking. Uh, but we can also use some of the, these metrics to relate back to our original goals and outcomes of these programs. And so one of the benefits of using uh, a third-party platform is that we see kind of common, consistent metrics across programs in different communities in our region. So it allows us to kind of compare apples to apples. It also provides, uh, Ride Report also offers a operator facing dashboard so that they can see the same metrics uh, that local agencies are seeing in case there's uh, a question about a specific vehicle um, or just general stats if you're using um, maybe like the number of trips to generate a fee. So it's really a single source of truth. And this platform uses the mobility data specification or MDS if you have uh, heard about it in a little more detail. And I think one of the benefits of using that third party platform again is that this is really potentially sensitive data. They have a lot of privacy protocols. They constantly monitor the feeds. Um, so it really gives us the ability to offer local and regional agencies um, an easy to use tool that really, it doesn't take a lot of staff time to kind of figure out how to use it. It's very user friendly, um, but also you don't have to build your own kind of backend tool to deal with this new data. Uh, and from specifically this MDS feed that is relatively new and not a lot of folks are set up to manage. So long story short, um, we do have this data platform project and we would love it if your community would join us if you're thinking about um, consider, or, uh, implementing a shared micromobility program, whether that's bikes or scooters, please reach out. We would love to give you a demo. We can help you with policy assistance so we can make sure that you have the ability to share that data with a third party platform um, or with Dr. Cog. Uh, so we're happy to come in kind of at any point. If you guys are thinking about implementing a shared micromobility program, please, please reach out. Um, we're currently working with Denver, Aurora, and Boulder, who uh, Boulder's considering bringing a shared micromobility program online. So we would love to hear from you. Um, my contact information is on the screen. Shoot me an email uh, or give me a call. I would love to chat. I'd be happy to take questions. If you have any questions for Emily, please raise your hand. We'll call on you. 
I am not seeing any hands raised. Thank you, Emily, for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next informational briefing will be on potential revisions to the uh, Metro Vision performance measures and targets. And I believe uh, Robert Spots is giving that presentation. Robert, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so last month, uh, we just had a discussion with you about some potential changes to the Metro Vision um, targets and measures. Uh, we've kind of refined those in the meantime. Um, the board had a bit of a discussion on it in their meeting, and we wanted to bring this back to you. This is not an action item, obviously. We're kind of looking for some general agreement on the concepts we're talking about. It'll eventually lead into a redlined version of the MetroVision plan, which, which will at that time be um, an action item. So as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're kind of updating these um, based on the best data that's available, as well as um, getting these kind of in line with Dr. Cog's recent um, planning activity, as well as other um, regional planning efforts. Uh, eventually, this would be a formal MetroVision plan amendment, um, probably later this year. So what we're, we're talking about here today is three kind of modifications. Um, these are uh, affecting the congestion metrics, as well as updating the target for uh, fatalities and serious injuries. And then two brand new measures and targets that we talked about last month um, that would um, be keeping track of active transportation. So uh, I'll get into all of these in just a moment here, but just framing this out. Um, and then part of this was discussed last month and through the board, but we're proposing that we hold off for this MetroVision amendment cycle and save it for the next one. Uh, the GHG um, targets, we're still in the process of waiting for uh, this, working with the state and seeing what the the targets will be for MPOs and the state themselves. There was a lot of discussion about housing and transportation costs at the board, the potential to remove this um, metric because the data is not very readily available. The board had some concern with that. So we're, we're continuing to explore whether there's other options for collecting the data as well as potential replacements. And finally, one new measure that we're still in the works, we're not, it's not ready for the limelight yet, but uh, that, that would focus on measuring uh, transit service quality. Uh, most importantly, waiting for the reimagined RTD study findings. So to get into it, the first one uh, proposal we're talking about is basically just a name change only, or just kind of rebranding what we've called TTV. That's kind of the um, standard engineer type of talk for this measure, and it means travel time variation. We're just proposing to, to make it something that is more relatable and more like understandable to the general public. So exact same measure, kind of same values, but instead of TTV or average travel time variation, we'll just call it extra travel time during rush hour. And so it's, this is all saying the exact same thing. It's just a little more relatable. It's saying if the baseline is during rush hour, it takes you about 22% longer to travel than if you were in free flow traffic. If you were driving at 2 a.m. versus 5 p.m., there's a bit of a difference, 22% on average throughout the evening. So same thing, just kind of clarifying the language. Um, we wanted to kind of enhance that and, and we were looking for other ways to, to measure congestion. We, you saw these, um, these th top three last month. And when the staff really got into discussions about it and we just consistently felt that they were actually just too complicated to explain essentially. There was too many words happening there and maybe the values didn't mean very much. And then I'll also mention Brian Weimer suggested, uh, which we really like the network with a bad mobility grade. The concerns when we really started digging into the data with that measure was that because you're measuring individual segments instead of an entire system, there's kind of these threshold issues where if something changes a little bit, you know, you could add many lane miles and you could have kind of big swings. We also kind of are consistently refining our methodologies with the CMP. So um, I think that would expose kind of changes um, to methodology more than actually system-wide changes. So we like the concept, we still think it's valuable and want to explore it, but what we are proposing, I'll get to in just one second. So um, going back one step, sorry, the reason we decided to replace this one daily person hours delay per capita, because again, just kind of a mouth, mouthful, it's difficult to understand and con conceptualize what that means. Um, so what we are proposing or what we'd like as staff, uh, open for discussion, of course, is that we've already got this extra travel time during rush hour 
we're also interested in what's happening um, not during rush hour. Is congestion getting worse in, in the afternoon? And what does that mean for things like peak spreading and how long throughout the day is um, congestion happening, the duration of congestion? So what we're proposing, and we'd like this concept, it's taking that same concept of the extra travel time, but instead of, well, in addition to the peak hour, what's happening in the mid-afternoon? How much, how much worse is traffic in the mid-afternoon? So we, we, we feel like it's keeping the same simple concept that um, you know, we've kind of already explained and then adding, um, adding that extra time where there may be different mitigation strategies for congestion. So at the end of the day, it would come out to look like this uh, for these two congestion metrics. Again, same concept, measuring different things and very important different things. Um, and one thing we're noticing, we don't have the 2050 values yet. We are crunching those as we speak. Um, we're looking at things like, look, in 20, oops, sorry, in 2040, uh, driving at 2 p.m. in the afternoon is about as bad as driving at five o'clock today. So it, it really puts things like that into perspective and how, how this congestion we anticipate with the continued growth of this region to really impact our lives throughout the entire day. Uh, the second proposal, I think we've discussed this significantly, but we just kind of want to get confirmation is um, matching what the board has uh, directed us and uh, zero fatalities by the year 2040 and zero severe districts by 2045, updating those targets. And then as discussed, no new information here, but again, as we discussed last month, we're interested in two new act active transportation measures and targets. One, that basically the active transportation system was defined in the active transportation plan. What share of that active transportation system has been completed? This is something actionable that we can do something about, right? It's, it's not, there's no human behavior. This is something that we can move the needle on very comfortably. And then how much of that, that system is um, high comfort share of facilities? So we have part of the system built, but we also wanna make sure that, that the system is um, high comfort. We would still, we would, if, if you agree and, and like these measures, we would kind of dig into exploring where we're at today and potential targets for the future, for future discussion. And that is my presentation. Again, here's just kind of what we talked about and are proposing. We're just seeking some agreement on these modifications and happy to have open discussion about any of them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Robert. Um, if you have any comments or questions or concerns, please raise your hand. Deborah, go ahead. Hello, um, Deborah Baskett, City of Westminster, Jefferson County representative. Um, I am really like these modifications a lot. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge the opportunity for peak spreading and just how our community is changing in times of uh, the hours people travel. So I, I'm pretty excited about that. It's a little confusing to me. I know you're trying to go for layperson speak to say extra travel time during rush hour because extra travel over, over what? So I was trying to think of something useful to offer and I don't have it yet, but I'll noodle on it. Um, I think the two measure targets of active transportation and high comfort of shared facilities are, are excellent. So I commend you. I think this is more reflective of what we're, we're trying to achieve in the region. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Mac. Thank you, Kent. Um, uh, Matt Callis, City of Aurora, Arapahoe County. Uh, good to be here. Um, a good presentation, Robert. Uh, appreciate that. Um, it strikes me as on the active transportation uh, measures, they're, they're looking at supply. It's a supply metric versus a use or a consumption or a service metric. And I'm just thinking, um, it may be helpful to combine both of those, have a combination of supply and use. And, and by use or service, I mean the, the connectivity that's offered, the connections from uh, origins to destination activity centers, um, uh, centers of opportunity, um, uh, education, recreation, services, et cetera, uh, on that. So that's something to uh, to look at, I think, or consider how is a best, what's the best methodology that could be, uh, uh, could be crafted to, to capture some of that. So thank you. 
Thank you, Mac. Any response to that, Robert? Um, I might have, uh, let's see. Melissa, is, is Melissa on? Do you have a response for that? I think we've kind of explored that a little bit. Actually, is Melissa in, able to chat? Robert, I can help too if you'd like. Thanks, go for it, Jacob. All right. Uh, let me put myself on video. Hi, everyone. Jacob Rieger. Um, so yeah, I appreciate those comments, Mac. And that is something that we can kind of talk about and consider. I will say, you know, just sort of philosophically, frankly, with um, bicycle, and pedestrian, bicycle and pedestrian travel, um, it is easier to measure supply and demand. Um, as I think we, we know, demand can be, you know, pretty variable. Um, we have been working hard to kind of up our game, so to speak, when it comes to um, the arena of bicycle and pedestrian counts. Um, and actually implementing the count program. Uh, in fact, we recently just published a kind of interactive um, online bike ped um, count map the same way that we do with traffic counts. Uh, we can send that out to folks. That's kind of a first big step um, in a larger sort of count program that we've been working on uh, over time. Um, so again, really just appreciate your suggestion, but just to say it's a little harder to measure sort of the you know, straight demand and use side of it because it is so variable. Uh, we all know that there are certain trails and certain facilities at certain times of day that certainly have high demand, you know, how do you sort of generalize that um, over a particular time period, over, you know, over the entire region. So we kind of gravitated more towards the network first, um, but we will think about your comments and appreciate them, Mac. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and and uh, the the point is that um, it, it's, it's trying to assess where you can deliver the most value and most utilization uh, to typically underinvested communities, underrepresented uh, uh, communities and, and groups as well. So another aspect in terms of equity um, could be um, addressed and reined in. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rick Pilgrim, you had questions or comments? Uh, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and. Uh, Robert and Jacob, uh, you know, ter terrific uh, revisions here. Um, I do want to bring up a comment that uh, that uh, I made um, sort of on the heels of uh, Phil Greenwald's comment as well, uh, and it and it echoes what uh, what Cal just talked about, which is uh, really a, a more um, definitive equity assessment, um, and. And that was, uh, you know, we we brought that up last time. I don't know that we had a, a detailed discussion about it. Uh, one of the points was that, uh, well, as as Mag says, uh, we're able to understand where we can make investments that have um, an additive effect in helping uh, uh, economically challenged areas to benefit from from those uh, transportation investments uh, to be more explicit about understanding where we do that and how we can do that. Uh, I think that relates well to the Metro Vision outcomes when one looks at you know, healthy and inclusive livable communities, uh, when we look at a safe and resilient natural and built environment. Um, the, the equity question or the equity value, I think, needs to come through more clearly. Uh, and then finally, uh, as, as we can expect, what comes out of the uh, President Biden's administration on, uh, on the new infrastructure plan, uh, equity is one of the top four considerations, along with uh, greenhouse gases that, uh, or you know, environmental effect. Um, and, and I think to be more explicit, perhaps puts us in better uh, line for discretionary funding that might come from federal grants and programs. So um, I didn't see a, a more explicit treatment of equity. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about how we might address that? And I'll let Jacob handle this one again. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Rick, for your comments. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start a response, and I'm actually going to call on our colleague, Andy Taylor, to help me out with this one. So in the big picture, Rick, you're absolutely right. Um, and it's something we've been talking about. Equity, as you know, is one of those sort of overarching topics that in some ways 
Um, you know, you put it in every measure, it's a separate measure, you know, what's the best way to deal with it? Um, you know, obviously we deal with equity really explicitly and really intentionally when it comes to preparation of the 2050 RTP, um, to the transportation improvement program and to a lot of our other products, um, just, you know, throughout sort of Dr. Cog. When it comes to specifically the Metro Vision Plan and some of the things we're talking about here, um, that's where I'm gonna lean on Andy. Uh, we've had some of those conversations and I think our staff feeling is that because it's such an important and overarching issue um, that we need to find a more, you know, sort of structured way to deal with it rather than, or, or a way to address it, uh, rather than just sort of, you know, including as part of one or two of these modifications. But Andy, can I ask you to weigh in a little bit? Sure, thanks Jacob. Um... Uh, we had a really healthy conversation with the board about uh, that included some of this as well. And one of the things that we advised them on was that um, these performance measures don't have to cover everything we want to look at. We're committed to a robust way of measuring progress. And so uh, a lot of the ideas that they brought up when we were talking about um, uh, different measures that were being proposed, uh, we were talking about uh, the data brief series that we do and other ways that we can explore areas that involve access to opportunity and these other places, things we want to discover, but that might not be, uh, we might not have a methodology that's that's mature enough to, to really see as, as a measure right now. Um, I think uh, what we did put in front of the board as potential new measures uh, related to inclusion. Um, while we do have done some preliminary work and thinking related to access to opportunity, uh, the inclusion measures that, that we uh, borrowed from some work that was done uh, by the Brookings Institution that's been working on the Prosper Colorado initiative uh, here led by the, the chamber, uh, really looking at either uh, racial inclusion, inclusion or geographic inclusion, trying to really identify what would be the end result if, if there were more equity, would we see this in some of these inclusion measures? And so um, that, that is gonna proceed into um, with along with other amendment uh, suggestions as well, based on that that board discussion uh, for additional consideration. Okay, well, I guess we'll, we'll just see where this goes. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for your comments. Uh, equity is something we need to keep uh, forefront there. Deborah, I saw you had your hand back up. Did you have additional? Questions or comments? Uh, Brian, Brian, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, you know, what we're really talking about here are, are do we have lead or lagging measures? And for the most part, these are lagging measures. I mean, they're, they're easy to measure because they're kind of in the past, if you will, but that makes them hard to change what we're looking at. So when we start looking at what are lead um, measures that we could come up with that give us something that we can make decisions on uh, and move forward. So um, I'll throw that out as a challenge to the group as to how do we get to more um, leading indicators of what we want to do and the desired results we want to get out of that. Thanks, Brian. Agreed. Uh, you know, that, that is what we are considering with these the active transportation measures that they are leading. We can do, we can make changes with our own actions. Is that what you had in mind, Brian? Yeah, I think some of those are, I mean, really what you're looking at is what have we completed, right? And what are we looking at completing? And that's kind of that active traffic, you know, active um, transportation. And those are easy things to accomplish, but, you know, is it getting us on the right track? And I think that's a little bit where Mac was going as to where is those investments needing to go? Okay. And that helps us make decisions on where that investment needs to go, as opposed to, well, it accomplished the, one of the goals, but is that given a, a limited resource, is that where the investment needs to be made? Okay. 
any response, Robert, or agree? Yeah, you know, or? I think I, I agree, Brad. I think I think you know the actors. The one kind of thing we were cautious about when proposing this active transportation corridor mileage, for example, was that we don't intend the active transportation system to be a static thing. Like we've just find it in the plan already, and it's going to stay that way forever. You know, there are different owners and operators of the various uh, facilities throughout the region, and the regional plan and, and corridors can change. There's also individual responsibility with you all and your local governments and prioritizing um, you know, your investments into these corridors. So um, you know, it's a flexible thing we're measuring here and there is kind of individual ownership um, for, for all of your communities to participate and to do those evaluations. Thank you, Robert. Um, Alex? I'd like to go ahead. Thank you, Alex Hydright, Boulder County. Um, I had a couple of questions related to the congestion measures. Um, one sort of building off of Deborah Baskett's question on the additional uh, congestion related travel time. So what is the, the additional time in comparison to? Is that in comparison to a, just a generic non-congested travel time or is that compared to midnight when presumably there's no congestion or what? I guess, what's the, the baseline for comparing the rush hour and the mid-afternoon travel times too? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a near theoretical free flow travel time, right? Yeah, I mean, especially in an arterial, if the speed limit's 25 miles or 35 miles an hour, you're still gonna hit red lights. You're not gonna just cruise at 35 miles an hour. But if you think about you know, a freeway at 2 a.m. when you're almost alone, that's, you know, there's no additional congestion caused by more vehicles than the facility can handle, right? Mm -hmm. So it is kind of a theoretical 2 a.m. travel time, if you, if you can imagine that. Okay. Um, and then my, my second question is, from this metrics perspective, would a 30-minute trip time that is on largely uncongested roadways, would that be better for achieving this metric than a 15-minute trip time um, that is on mostly congested roadways? And I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, does this metrics skew us towards building longer circuitous routes um, to provide for trips in order to reduce congestion, but would still result in net increases in travel time. And so just wondering about the relationship between travel time versus congestion time. Right, so if, what we're actually measuring here is it's a, again, this is the big regional measure, but it's basically saying, what if, how long would it take one car to drive on every single roadway that's in the regional roadway system at 2 a.m. How, how much time would that, so, you know, we have a huge system that goes I-70 all the way out east, right? So that's never really congested, um, com like compared to like I-25. Um, but anyway, it's theoretically, if you, if you were magically able to drive on the entire regional roadway system at 2 a.m., how much time would that totally take? You know, whether that is four hours, 10 hours, I don't know what it is. And then if you do the same thing at five o'clock, how much longer? And, Right now, on average, throughout the entire region, it's about it's about twenty two percent longer. Does that make sense? So there's no there's no benefit to there's no the ratio is the entire system. It's not about specific individual trips. No, no, I, I get that it's about the entire system. I guess I'm just I'm wondering and worried if this pushes us if if longer uncongested trips would appear better under this metric than shorter congested trips, despite those having more vehicle miles traveled and thus, and also taking more end-to-end -end travel time um, than a shorter trip that's, you know, 100% congested. There's, yeah, there's also not really a, a VMT or kind of magnitude component of this measure. It's really, it's, so it doesn't really measure how many people are experiencing that level of congestion or the routes they're taking. It's really kind of a, it's just the entire system. I'm sorry if I'm not understanding your question or answering it appropriately. Okay. I, I, I think that helps. I think he's asking if we build more roadways, it disrupts more and, and puts more vehicles out there, which could mean increased greenhouse gases. But even though it's less congested, it still may, the shorter trip may use, uh, pollute the air less and, and not impact folks as much. And maybe I'm wrong on that, Alex, but I think that's where you're headed. No, I, I think that's a much more eloquent way of putting what I was trying to get at. Well, yeah, I, I can, uh... I'll address it this way that we, we you know, we, we have struggled with does, you know, measuring and trying to reduce congestion compete with some of our other targets and measures. Um, 
and it is a challenging thing, but congestion is also very important to many people and industry and freight. And so, you know, we, we are not here to defend these and we're open to discussion about them, but we, we did feel like it, you know, the primary way that people travel in this region is still vehicles and congestion is still important. Um, and reducing that is something that I think a lot of people care about. That said, we're not wedded to these in any way. Um, and we do acknowledge that in a way these do compete with some of our other measures and targets. If, if we're, I guess, opening up the, the philosophical underpinning of the metric, I guess I would like to, to bring that up. Um, you know, for the other metrics, the, the safety targets, you know, I think have a pretty good conception of what that looks like. You know, we provide a transportation system that kills zero people per year. We've achieved the, um, you know, one aspect of the vision zero target, and obviously providing a certain percentage of high comfort facilities for the active transportation. That's, that's what success looks like. And I guess for this metric, you know, the success for this metric is a lot of wide open roadways where people can travel in on an uninterrupted um, traffic flow. And to me, that doesn't really seem realistic or achievable. So I'm wondering why we're measuring it if there's, there's no foreseeable way to, um, to achieve it. Well, we haven't, we haven't defined the target yet. So, you know, historically with TTV, the target has been not trying to make it basically make it not as bad as it could be in the worst case scenario. So we we are, you know, based on what we know right now, there's going to be significantly more congestion in the future. We're not we're not anticipating any type of open roadways. It's we're just trying the, the target's intent was to make it not as bad as it could be, which is really severe in 2050 congestion. So that's that was that's how it's been historically, but the target is something that we will come back and discuss in the future once we have defined numbers for the base and, and future. Ron, you had a comment? Robert, Robert really hit the point I was, I was gonna make to Alex's question, but I'll, I'll amplify it a little bit. I think not only, um, not only Alex, could we, could we not achieve sort of a non, an uncongested condition during the peak, out, peak hour? We wouldn't, we wouldn't want to. Um, you couldn't afford to provide that much vehicular capacity on the system to, to accommodate that um, kind of a, a non-congested peak hour situation. And if, and if you did, even if you could afford it, even if you're willing to, even if you were willing to um, uh, acquire all of the land you needed to make all those facilities big enough to accommodate those vehicles, even if there were uh, radical changes in vehicle technology, I don't know what it would take. Um, it, you would be so overbuilding the system for you know ninety percent of the day that it wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think um, once you see the targets, and if you kind of go back and look at the existing targets, it really it really is about sort of reducing the degradation of of the system over time, um, and you know kind of maintaining where you're at or not letting it get maybe as bad as it might as it. Um, as it would be if you if you didn't take any actions. I guess just to clarify, so this is the this is the measure. Are there targets proposed for this measure yet, or is that a, a future next step? They, they would be incorporated into this modification. We're still working on the 2050 data as we speak. We we would have you know proposed targets for discussion maybe as soon as next month, but in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, Ron, and Robert. Are there any additional questions for Robert? If not, uh, thank you, Robert. And we'll move on to our uh, next uh, presentation, which is the fiscal year 2024-2027 TIP policy elements, uh, project scoring and project readiness. And I believe, Todd, uh, you're making this presentation? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. All right, great. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to continue our conversation on the 24 to 27 TIP policy development, and we're going to dive deeper into project scoring and project readiness. Um, and because we're not there in person, we can't serve you coffee 
or any water or any snacks, uh, we are going to dive into being a little bit more interactive in this presentation. Uh, so for those who are following along, if you'd like to open up a clean uh, tab on your web browser or have your smartphones handy, uh, we will dive into that here in a few slides and, and have that within a couple of locations in the presentation. Oops, let's skip this. So first we'll dive into project scoring and uh, we've identified two elements as part of the scoring process. The first being the scoring roles. So whether that is by Dr. Cog staff or by the forums and then the methods that are used within that scoring. Uh, so first for the regional share scoring and process, um, we've discussed this in the past as part of the regional share, share process. But again, because scoring is part of the regional share, uh, we certainly just did wanna bring everyone back up to speed um, regarding the regional share. So that process essentially goes where the applications are submitted to Dr. Cog staff to score. Um, the last time and what we anticipate for the future, approximately a dozen staff uh, scored those projects individually. Uh, then we took all dozen of those and then received an average score for each project. Those average scores along with other factors uh, were then used by the project review panel to both, you know, to really develop um, and recommend um, a, a list of projects to the committees and the board for action into the draft tip. So our recommendation is that we're not gonna propose any changes. It seemed to work well in the past and will continue, um, or at least plan to continue that going into the future. So regarding the sub-regional share. Uh, so if you recall, this is a process that is used uh, through the forums. Um, those applications are submitted directly to the forums. Um, then the forums will go through the process of, of scoring, um, discussing and then prioritizing the projects, and then finally making that, that recommendation back to Dr. Cog um, committees and the board. Um, the forums also have the opportunity and the option to ask Dr. Cog staff to score those projects if they wish. Um, they also have the ability to include additional questions um, along, you know, to their application if they also wish. Um, the recommendation that uh, we're making is one, uh, is for the sub-regional forum members to not score their own projects. Uh, so within a, a couple of the forums um, during this last process did express concern about um, individual scores actually scoring their own projects. Um, we, you know, we did look into this a little bit and uh, we did find that it wasn't really going to make any large scale or any effect at all really uh, upon those scores that the forum sort of developed. Um, but again, just to sort of eliminate that problem, um, we decided to push, put forth this recommendation that um, basically, you know, if you are a member of the, of the forum and you submitted your own applications, um, that you would not be allowed to score your own projects. Um, and then the second recommendation would be that after those scores, after that scoring is done, but before you make those discussions, is to send those scoring sheets to Dr. Cog staff um, just for us to take another look at it um, for quality control, um, put another set of eyes on it to review them. Um, we have absolutely no intention of changing the scores, um, but we certainly would wanna look out for any, anything that really sticks out for any irregularities, irregular, um, but anything that we can sort of say that this doesn't make quite sense and then report that back to the individual forums. So the next category would be the scoring methods. Um, so the existing methods before, before uh, within the policy is that each score applies a high, medium or low score to each of the questions, um, sort of based on the responses in comparison to the predefined definitions within the application. And so essentially what that means is within the application itself um, for each set of questions, um, we do say a high score will do X, Y, and Z, or a low score in this category would, would have a X, Y, or Z. Um, so we sort of predefine what those definitions are. Um, and then we also ask that the scores really go back and take a look at their first initial set of scores and sort of make a comparison to the other applications that were scored um, and what those responses were. Um, of course, then when you actually determine what that 
may be, whether it's a high, medium, or low. Uh, when you actually translate that to the scoring sheets, um, we translate that to a three, two, or one. So three being high and one being low. Um, when we look back at the last cycle and looked at all of the funded projects, um, the average score for seven of the eight forums um, ranged from 1.9 to 2.5. So essentially a six, a point, a six tenths of a point difference in that range. Uh, the recommendations that we're making uh, simply is to eliminate any reference in the applications to a high, medium, or low score. Um, essentially what we're doing when we translate that over into future discussions, and when you translate that over into the scoring sheet, we are already going through the process of changing that to a, a numbered value. So literally having the words of high, medium, low within the application, one, it could be confusing, but two, it's just not really necessary. We can just continue and, and change that over to a, a one to five scores, which, which is what we're proposing, instead of using a one to three score. And again, five being high, one being low. Um, the Adams County Forum did use a one to five scale instead of a one to three scale in the last, um, last round. Um, I just talked about that 0.6 uh, variation of the funded projects. Um, for the Adams County Forum, they did have a range of 1.6. So again, only one forum to really kind of go off of, go off of, but this should really provide sort of uh, a better definition between the funded projects, hopefully open that up for a little bit more of a discussion. All right, so this is where we sort of get the interaction. Um, you can go to minty.com and enter the code that you see in the bottom left-hand side uh, within a browser. Or for those who are on their smartphones, can scan that QR code. I'll give you a, a, a minute here or so to really get this entered in, into your information before we move on. We'll go to the next slide and it also has the web address and the code and the um, on the top of the next screen. Okay, again, if you if you didn't quite get the code, um, the address and the code is at the top of the screen. So do you agree or disagree that sub regional forum members may not score their own projects? Right, we'll give it another 15 seconds or so here. All right, I will move on to the next question. Do you agree or disagree that scores uh, should be sent to Dr. Cog's staff for quality control checks and review without changing the scores after the forum has scored? Okay, another 10 seconds or so. All right, next question. Agree, disagree, or not sure that the policy and applications should remove reference to high, medium, low and change to a score range of five to one with five being high and one equaling low. All right, another few seconds. And I believe our next screen kind of gives you the ability to kind of free flow with it to put in any other uh, answers that you would like. Um, so any questions or discussion items on the scoring rules or methods? And again, feel free to enter 
um, from the menti.com screen um, or, your, or your smartphone. Um, in addition, uh, Mr. Chair, we can also, if anyone would like to raise hands and make a verbal comment at this time, that would be fine too, before we move on to the next sec section. Alex, uh, you raised your hand. Um, yeah, it's Alex Hyder with Boulder County. Um, it looks like this would still be permitted um, with the proposed guidance, but one of the things that we wrestled with the, with the Boulder County Sub-Regional Forum with the last tip cycle is that we had most of our scores were, I would say, in the middle in terms of generosity versus harshness or stinginess of their points. And then we had one of our um, forum members who was a pretty harsh grader. And so the impact of them not scoring their own project is that they gave everyone else's projects harsh scores, but then their own project didn't get that same harsh score. And so what we had, our solution to that was that folks did not score their own projects, uh, but after everybody scored projects, we averaged the score that they gave for all projects to essentially determine how generous or stingy they were with their points and then corrected for that bias so that if you were a harsh grader, you didn't get a benefit by virtue of not scoring your own uh, project. And so it, I'm, I'm not sure if I wanna suggest that that be a requirement for all sub-regional forums to do, but I just wanna share that that's something that the Boulder County Sub-Regional Forum did with the last tip cycle to address for the fact that some folks are more generous and some folks are more stingy with their points. Thank you, Alex. So I, I can say this because I sort of led the effort on the regional share side of sort of managing the, the dozen or so Dr. Cog staff to go through that scoring process. And we had the same experience. Um, we did have a couple scores who were perhaps a little bit more stringent um, than others. I believe we also had it on the other end where they were more apt to give a higher score than a lower score on, on most projects. So that was one thing that I certainly did not, um, you know, really express. I did not want to tell them, this is the method of how you should score. You should score, you know, for example, you should, every time you look at a score, you should consider that a three, and then you can knock it down from there. Or, you know, consider when you first look at a question that it's a two, and then you can mark it up to a three or mark it down to a one from there. Um, as long as there's enough, you know, there's as many scores um, as approximate we had, which is, you know, again, around a, a dozen scores, scores, um, in theory, everything should sort of work its way out in the end. Um, but we certainly can look at perhaps another process that may be, uh, you know, providing some more clear direction on how to score those. I guess my point is that it's it's different for the regional and the sub-regional processes because the regional, you have the same people scoring every project. And so if somebody is relatively stingy, they're going to be relatively stingy with every project. Whereas on the sub-regional side, you have a different group of people scoring each project because the person whose agency it is didn't score their own project. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions that anyone wanted to ask in person versus what we see on the screen before we move on? I don't see any other hands okay. raised, Todd. Okay, uh, we, will, we will take everything that we see here. Uh, we will take that back. And certainly if we need to bring that back next month um, for any follow-up comment or questions, uh, we certainly can do that. All right, so now we're gonna move on to project readiness. Um, so this is a, it's an interesting topic. And you know, the way that we view this might be slightly different than the way that you might view this um, or even CDOT or RTD. Um, it just really depends on how you look at it. But the way we're trying to present this is the status of a project to ensure that it's ready for development and implementation. So what we're trying to focus in on is what are you doing as an applicant even before you fill out the application? Um, you know, some things that we have seen over time, um, applications that are not necessarily ready to go when they are actually filled out, um, 
those are the ones that seem to be underdeveloped. Um, they are subject to uh, more project delays, um, typically some more cost, cost overruns and even project cancellations. Um, you know, I'm sure we all have horror stories of how project delays have gone where um, there was perhaps a phase or a part of a phase that was caught off guard by somebody. Um, there are stories out there where, you know, there's a million or $2 million in cost overruns um, and even pro projects being canceled. And while I certainly can't sit here and, and say that these are all due to not having um, projects being ready even before they applied, uh, I'm sure that we could take a look at and say that, you know, project readiness probably wasn't the focus uh, of some of these applications. Uh, and certainly, certainly when you look at the cancellations, the, the funding of these could have gone to other projects on the waiting list that were certainly more ready to go. So now we can kind of move into those topics for discussion and what some of the staff recommendations might be. Uh, so first is the application cost estimates and inflation rates. Um, so if you recall in the, the, the last call for the 20 to 23 cycle, uh, we did require that applicants use a, a standard inflation rate. Um, and even if they wanted to, they could, um, you know, add to that rate, make it slightly higher if they felt it was necessary. Um, but we are, so we are also proposing to keep that, uh, that everyone uses an inflation rate that is standard among all the applications. But we are also making a recommendation that um, there, that every applicant use a CDOT supplied cost estimate um, within their application. Um, what kind of our process of thinking is this will help really keep all the applications consistent, again, using that same cost estimate form and really be aligned with how the CDOT and the federal aid standards are so that hopefully there's not as many surprises further on down the road. Um, we are also looking at beefing up sort of the, the first part of the TIP applications. So if you recall, the first part is just asking the very basic project information, um, but there's certainly aspects within that part one that we can um, add additional text for, whether it be on the key project elements um, or the current status of the project. Again, there's just things that we can add to the application that will sort of get the applicant thinking a little bit more about what they have done to date um, before they even begin you know, fully filling out the application. And our, our last recommendation uh, is sort of a larger, um, larger recommendation, but we're looking at possibly adding a portion to the scoring se se section, um, so part two of the application, um, a project, a section on project, project readiness. Um, and this weighting would be approximately five to 10%. And again, I think maybe once we nail this down, we can have further discussions down the line to the, you know, the extent exactly what that weighting is. But again, that's just sort of our first inkling on, on sort of where that may fit in. Um, some of the questions that we have um, kind of wrestled with internally. Um, so a project might be more ready, you know, if it had a previous pre-construction uh, phase or elements that were already funded through Dr. Cog, therefore through the, the federal aid process. Um, if the, the application is for a single phase, so whether the, again, whether design only or construction only, et cetera. Um, looking at right away and what those anticipated needs are um, regarding the IGA, um, could this IGA just be completed with just an option, a simple option letter? So again, you know, that sort of relates back to the first bullet um, where you've possibly already funded portions of a project through Dr. Cog. Um, what the status of that project is within your approved CIP, um, the level of experience, or even if the project manager that you'll be using has federal aid uh, experience, um, what is the status of your local match? Um, so is it just match that is coming from one source, or will you need to reach out to multiple sources, um, maybe even requiring an IGA between local governments, all that would need to be put in place um, as part of the project. Um, what is the status or the impacts of other things like utilities, railroads, right-of-way, historical resources? 
And again, it just relates back to um, the times, you know, the amount of time that would take to put the project together. Um, so for example, most of you know, anytime that you're gonna be working with railroads, that's probably a year long process minimum. Uh, so again, just things to think about. Um, what is the level of public support for the project? Um, and then certainly, have you gone through or what is the level of internal or external review of those pitfalls um, that may be lurking out there for a project such as what you're proposing? And again, this is not an all inclusive list. There may be others um, that we can certainly add. There may be some in here where it's, it's, it's not necessarily going to contribute to project readiness, but again, we can kind of work through those and eventually develop something if that is uh, something that everyone would like to go forward with. So now I believe we're going to go back to menti.com. Um, and if you're still logged in, um, you can start answering these questions. Um, if not, the, the address and the code is at the top of your screen. Um, so we're looking for a yes, no, or not sure response to, should all applicants continue to use a standard inflation rate and also be required to use a CDOT supplied cost estimate form? All right, about 10 more seconds. Perfect, all right, next question. Uh, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree. Do you generally agree with adding a new project readiness scoring section in part two of the application with a weighting of, again, approximate five to 10% and with that weighting factor to be determined at a later point. About five more seconds here. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so this one's slightly different. Um, so we're asking you to rank the following in order of importance to project readiness. Uh, and very similar to what we did before, I believe the next screen will let you uh, enter any other comments that you may have that certainly we can look at. We'll probably end up giving this here a couple minutes because this one will certainly take, take everyone a little bit longer. And certainly, Mr. Chair, as we're going through this, if, if there's any comments, we certainly can address those uh, by voice while we're going through this process. So again, this one will take a slightly longer than the others.
Todd, will you be uh, sending out these Minimeter results in a follow-up uh, email to the to the TAC? Yes, we can certainly do that. I think that would be good. And we also can send out a, a, a sort of a new uh, PowerPoint or, or or address for this. So if they would like to take it on them on their own uh, and take a little bit more time to go through these comments, we can certainly do that too. That sounds good. All right, we'll give a, just a slightly bit longer. We'll get up here. We're at 17 comments so far. So we'll work our way into the, the low 20s here. Todd, this is Alex Hutter, Boulder County. I did a quick question. Does Dr. Cog have any initial thoughts on how to measure the level of public support for a project? <laughs> um, my initial thoughts simply go to, has the project ever been part of a public process? Um, I mean, I think that's really that a first initial step. Um, I think once you get beyond that, you know, it's really a matter of was it perceived well or was it not? Um, but really beyond that, I'd be, it'd be open for discussion. It's a, this is Ron, Alex, it's a, it's a, it's a really tough one. And I think that's why we're, we're not sure what to do with that. Um, you know, some some jurisdictions are really good at sort of um, really getting out a bunch of stakeholder groups to submit support letters for a project. Um, but sometimes we see that the projects that got get hung up um, might be the ones where you might have lots of stakeholder group support for a project, but the neighborhood association of an adjacent neighborhood or two that the project goes through haven't signed off on the project or not comfortable with the project. And when the project, and when it comes to project development, come out in droves to oppose the project. Um, and that can really kind of bog down um, a project. So sort of considering the relative importance of different types of support, you know, might be, a, might be something to look at. Yeah. I guess where my mind goes is no applicant is gonna support, is gonna submit letters from stakeholders that oppose their project. So you're only ever going to get letters of support. So how do you figure out who you're not hearing from and apply that yeah. on a consistent basis? Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, and again, we can send this out so that there can be some additional comments if that's uh, how you wish to, to give them to us. Um, so again, this is very open-ended. Uh, any questions or discussions on readiness issues which could be if you have a, a new idea on how to look at project readiness, we certainly uh, would be open to taking that or any other methods or ways that Dr. Cog could really sort of hone in on this issue and uh, try to address it as much as possible. Any of any of the folks that saw thought it was a bad idea to include a readiness um, kind of criteria in the in the submittal um, want you know I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to force you to comment. But if you want to um, convey sort of why you think it's a bad idea, it'd be helpful to hear from you.
I think to the to the one comment there that it seems that Dr. Cog is pushing for funding construction ready projects only and not funding pre construction activities, probably not not accurate. Um, um, I think our our intent is just reinforcing the importance of whatever phase of a project gets awarded funds in a tip. Uh, we want we want those we want those funds to be able to be obligated. We want that project to be able to proceed. So we're not tying up our, our very precious scarce um, uh, tip dollars on projects that that can't proceed. And that's that's whether that's a design phase of a project, a right of way phase of a project, or a construction phase of a project. Um, and I think there's we've we've demonstrated in the last tip cycle there's real value to funding pre-construction phases of a project. Um, but to get a project ready that can go to construction maybe in the next tip cycle. So that's not the intent of this conversation. The intent of the, the intent of this idea is to is to make sure that when when funds are awarded to a project that that project can proceed and those funds can get obligated um, in the in the time that we anticipated. Okay, I'll give everyone maybe another 30 seconds or so here. All right, and again, if you have further comments or questions, feel free to, to reach out um, and certainly we can, can have a little bit more discussions or when we send this out, we can, uh, you can certainly add your comments at, at that time. Um, so this was included, the, the, the tip, tip schedule was included in your packet, but I did wanna show this only because we slightly updated it since the agenda packet uh, did go out. Um, so again, just kind of looking at the July um, column here, um, again, we'll follow back up on project readiness based on what we just, uh, the answers that we just received. Um, we're also going to be talking about uh, five additional topics. Um, most of those should go rather quick. So I guess I know it is a lot, um, but we certainly wanted to give ourselves a little bit more time to prepare having discussions with you on how to further incorporate Dr. Cog plans, um, the tip focus areas and the tip set-asides. Uh, the original plan was to bring that to you next month and then have follow-up discussions in August, um, but we're not quite ready at that stage yet to, to fully bring that discussion forward. So we wanted to give ourselves a little additional time. And again, we'll kick those off at your August meeting and follow up in September. Um, and I think once we have those sort of nailed down, uh, by the end of September. Hopefully, um, we will be all ready to bring a draft application and draft policy document to you in October. And again, uh, uh, the schedule is fluid depending on how these discussions go. Um, and certainly anyone um, who is at a TAC meeting, if you have other topics that you would like to discuss, um, please let us know and we can uh, certainly bring those into the fold. So that is it. Um, I think at this point, is there any additional comments or questions on any of the material um, that we've sort of gone through so far? If there are additional questions or comments for the, uh, Todd, please raise your hand. Todd, I am not seeing any additional hands raised. So thank you for your presentation and leading us through this Perfect. discussion. Thank you. Um, our next informational item is the 2021 raise grant request. And Ron, I understand you're going to lead this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Pepsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. Um, I'll make this quick. We're running a little short on time, but um, we um, sent out information about the raise grant program. Um, again, this is formally Tiger formerly build, um, but the the notice of funding opportunity uh, came out. 
with a billion dollars available nationally uh, for the program, $30 million of that available nationally for planning grants. There's a planning category here um, for sake of transparency um, to pursue opportunities to coordinate and just make sure the region was sort of mutually aware of folks um, interest in applying for raised grants through this cycle. We did send out information on June 4th um, to uh, member jurisdictions and partner agencies around the region asking for just some basic information about potential uh, raised grant applications that folks might be submitting uh, for consideration. Uh, we asked for uh, those responses by June 18th. We received three submittals. Um, after the agenda packet for TAC went out, we received three more. Uh, so we did send out the supplemental information to everyone. Uh, so you should have that. I'm just gonna quickly go through the six uh, that we became aware of. So RTD uh, is um, has indicated an interest in uh, sub, uh, uh, submitting a planning grant application for $4 million for an $8 million total project cost for Northwest Rail Planning Study, um, looking again, uh, evaluating the, the Northwest Rail uh, Corridor. Um, the uh, DEN the airport um, indicated a $1.2 million request for a $1.5 million Pena Boulevard transportation and mobility plan uh, study of the Pena Corridor from I-70 to the airport. Again, that's a planning, planning application. The remaining four are all for construction. Uh, so Commerce City um, and East 88th Avenue from I-76 to Highway 2 project, uh, 20, that's a $20.15 million request uh, on a $30.9 million uh, total project cost. The City and County of Denver, uh, Washington Street livability improvements from 47th to 52nd Street, uh, $25 million request on a $50.5 million uh, total project cost. Uh, Golden uh, Heritage Road US-6 interchange improvement project. Again, that's a $25 million uh, grant request on a $39 million uh, project cost. And then uh, Longmont State Highway 119 Hover Street um, intersection improvements and an $18.1 million request on a $27.1 million uh, project. Again, we sent all of these out, certainly, with a little bit of time, if any of those project sponsors have folks here and they wanna say anything about the project, they're welcome to. We didn't bring these forward to TAC for any sort of approval. Again, this is information and uh, we as an agency are reserving the reserving our right to, to not submit grant, app or, uh, grant support letters for projects that we didn't get this information uh, for uh, from, from project sponsors. Um, or for any projects that um, are not consistent with the 2050 um, Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, up to you if you want to take time to allow any of the project sponsors that wish to um, make any comments. Um, otherwise, I'd be happy to take any questions from members of TAC. Uh, let's start with questions. Um, I think part of the reason that you brought this forward, Ron, was was because of a request earlier to know what was maybe being submitted as race grip grants in the region so that the uh, other jurisdictions, if they so desired to give a letter of support, they also could do that. So sure. uh, are there any uh, questions from from them? Um, George, if you'll go ahead from from Yes, from yes. hi, Ken. Uh, hi, Ron. Thanks for the presentation. Um, it's George Holcomb from Den Airport. Uh, I'm just asking procedurally, um, is Dr. Koch going to provide the letter of support? Um, and, and what's the time frame for that? Well, I think, yes. I mean, if, if, we get, if we get a request from the project sponsor for any of these six projects um, and um, th that have been brought forward and it, the project is consistent with the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, I think we are very likely to, to provide an agency support letter for the grant application. Um, that, was, that was part of this, um, uh, requesting that folks brought, brought projects forward and, and let us all know uh, if, they were, if you were submitting a project. So yes, and given that the submittal deadline on the raise grants is July 12th, that gives us um, a couple of weeks to complete that process. And um, if, if the sponsor 
uh, can wants to send those requests to me, um, you can do that for for a letter. It's also helpful if you if you provide us a little um, kind of template uh, for any. Uh, pertinent information you want us to include in in a support letter, we can turn those around pretty quickly. Thank you, Bart. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ron. Um, uh, there's one agency in Douglas County that may be submitting um, a raise grant, a uh, Castle Rock. Um, can they still uh, get with you directly and? Uh, um, talk about their project if they want a support letter. Is that or has that ship sailed? They 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 can, um, but it, I think the whole the whole point of this was really to uh, to vet those ahead of time and and sort of um, bring those forward so that everyone was aware. I think uh, we are we're less likely to to um, offer a support letter for a project that that was non responsive to this request. Art, that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay. Alex? Thank you. Um, Ron, just to uh, clarify something you said, for the, the six projects where you did receive the, um, the forms on time, is that going to be up to Dr. Cogstaff to review and confirm their conformity with the 2050 RTP and then basically decide whether or not to provide a letter of support for? <laughs> Yes, and if we if we have any questions, we'll we'll um, direct those to the project sponsor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I do not see any other hands raised. I I thank you, Ron, for that update, and um, I think we'll move on to the administrative items at this time, if that's acceptable. Thank you to you. All right, um, Carson uh, Priest, do you have any updates on the AMP working group? Here, Mr. Chair, I'll turn my camera on here today so everyone can see my wonderful face. Um, earlier this month, the AMP Working Group met and heard a series of informational briefings from CDOT this month regarding their open data portal, the Colorado Connected Vehicle Program they're working on, and they're working creating a transit emissions dashboard. The focus areas of the AMP Working Group also provided some brief updates as they continued their work in those specific areas. That's really all I have, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to take questions if there are any. Okay. Thank you, Carson. Are there any questions for Carson today? All right. Um, are there any other matters or comments that need to come before the, the TAC today? If you'll please raise your hand from the TAC members. Yes, Alex, go ahead. Yes, Alex Hatter with Boulder County again. Um, I guess I was wondering to, I wanted to follow up on a topic from the May TAC agenda and um, ask when we'll be revisiting the um, 2024 through 2027 regional tip share eligibility requirements. And I know there's some new requirements being proposed by Dr. Cogstaff, including the staging period requirements that received a good bit of discussion at the May TAC agenda and was wondering when um, that'll be brought back to TAC um, for further discussion. I guess where I'm coming from is Boulder County is still pretty uncomfortable with the current Dr. Cog staff proposal to use the staging periods from the RTP for the next tip share. So wondering when we'll be revisiting this topic. Okay. Uh, Todd or Ron? Uh, uh, Todd, do you yeah. Go ahead? yeah, Alex, um, this is Todd. Uh, so we are planning on having a discussion with the board um, in July. Um, so we will sort of gauge based on their comments, when is the best time to bring that back? Um, I mean, certainly one option is to bring that back um, with the TAC meeting that is next month. And honestly, I'd have to look at the timing of that schedule wise to see if that would work out. Um, but if it does not, certainly we can bring that back in August um, and bring you back sort of a report based on what the board comment was and, and sort of the, the direction to take it from there. Okay. But, but it will be an agenda item for the board at their July meeting in a couple weeks? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Todd and Alex. 
Are there any other questions or uh, matters to come before the TAC? I do not see any other hands raised. Our next meeting is July 26th. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.